John chapter 7 this morning, if you have a copy of God's Word, John chapter 7, and uh, it's on page 945, if you're using the Bibles that are provided there by the church, John uh, the 7th chapter, and you may have heard the phrase, a day in the life. I found out this week that that was actually the title of a Beatles song from years ago, which I did not know. I wouldn't know. But it's also been used as a title to books and articles and documentaries about people's lives. Sort of the idea of giving people a glimpse into the lives of famous or well-known people. Documentaries are made sometimes and they follow someone around so you can see what's going on in their life. That person that you know but you really don't know and it's a way to sort of give you a glimpse of what's going on. The passage that we pick up in today is sort of a day in the life. It's actually more than a day but it is a glimpse of the life of Jesus at this time in John chapter 7. Jesus is actually six months prior to the cross now. And we pick up what's happening around him and the reactions of people. We're going to see the reactions of the religious leaders, the reactions of his own brothers, and eventually we'll see the reactions of the people, the common people of his day uh, in the city of Jerusalem. This passage will remind us that people do respond to Jesus. And I want you to know this morning that every person who hears the gospel, who hears the message that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross that Christ died and was buried and rose again for our sins. Every person who hears that responds in some way or another. I want you to believe, though, that your response matters. How you respond makes all the difference in the world in your life. And I want you today, what I want you to do is I want you to make whatever is necessary in your life, whatever response is necessary in your life to be In a proper relationship with God, that is what I want you to do today. John chapter 7, we're going to read the first uh, 10 verses. If you're able, would you rise with me and stand as we read the Word of God together, as we honor the Word of God? Chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it and that its works are evil. You go up to this feast, I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time is not yet fully come. And when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. This is the word of God. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Speak mightily to us, Father. Draw us near. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, it's been two months Since we were studying in the Gospel of John, we finished the sixth chapter on May the 7th and we took a two months break. But it's been six months since the timeline of Jesus. It's six months between the end of chapter 6 and the end of chapter 7. Six months passes. John doesn't tell us anything and he picks up here six months later. Now we know that because of this uh, this notation of the feast of the Jews, of uh, the Jews' feast of tabernacles in verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. That was the fall feast. That was somewhere in September, October time frame. When we were in the sixth chapter, we saw another feast, the feast of Passover. You can flip back to chapter 6, verse 4, and John tells us that the Passover there was at hand. Now, The Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. That was the uh, spring feast. That was the April feast. Uh, Then there's the Pentecost feast. It happens in early summer. And then there is the Feast of Tabernacles. So we've moved from April to October now. And what we learn is, chronologically, as I said earlier, it's six months to the next Passover. And that next Passover is when Jesus will be crucified. 
Well, John doesn't tell us anything about that six months, but the Bible does. The other gospel writers tell us about what was Je Jesus was doing there during that six months' time in Galilee. He was traveling that area. He went from the northwest to the southeast. He performed miracles, healings. He cast out demons. He fed the 4,000. That would happen during this time. But probably the most important thing he did was he spent time discipling, teaching his men, those 12 men. He drew them near to him to teach them and to pour into them. He taught them extensively. During this time would be the first time that he told them about his uh, rejection in Jerusalem, that he would be arrested, that he would be crucified, and that he would be raised again. And so they heard that for the first time. This was during that time that he took his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, up on the mountain, and they experienced a little bit of his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. That happened then. Uh, all this while, Jesus was... Uh, devoted to teaching these men what they needed to do to be uh, the men who would lead the church after he was gone. He was discipling them. And that's important because, to be honest with you, discipleship is the real ministry of the church. The real ministry of the church is ultimately discipleship. We need to hear the gospel so we can get saved. But immediately when we get saved, we need to be discipled. We need to be taught the word. And we must allow that word to teach us, to change us, to develop our character and lead us so we can be followers of Christ. This is why we have Bible study groups, not because we have nothing else to do, because we want to learn the word of God, because the word of, word of God is how we come to follow Jesus. We want to know God's word so we can follow Christ. Now listen, you cannot follow Christ without being taught his word. You're not going to stumble into it. You're not smart enough to follow Jesus without his word. No one ever was. You're not the first one to show up on the scene, not able to do it. No one can follow Christ without the word of God. But you can be taught the word, not follow. John MacArthur writes this about discipleship. The measure of any church's success is not the size of its congregation, but the depth of its discipleship. And so our goal for each of us, it needs to be discipleship. I need to do a better job as a disciple-making pastor. And you need to do a better job being a disciple and a disciple-maker because that's God's goal for us. Now, that's the six-month summary real quick between chapter 6 and chapter 7. Now we pick up this text of what's happening in this day in the life of Jesus. Two major things I want to show you today that he, he experienced, that he faced. First, a day in the life included the hatred of his enemies. The hatred of his enemies. The Bible says here in chapter 7, uh, verse 1, that the Jews sought to kill him. The Jews, this meant the religious leaders, the ruling authorities. When John uses these words, these Jewish leaders sought to kill Jesus. Now, when we ended chapter 6, we talked about the fact that Jesus was already experiencing and would experience many different reactions by people. One of the things he experienced and would experience was uh, betrayal. Look at chapter 6, verse 64. This is a reference to Judas and those who would betray him. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. So there's a sort of a foreshadowing for the reader. Someone's going to betray him. He also experienced abandonment. Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples walked back and went back and walked with him no more. These 11 men, one would betray him, the other would abandon him, the other 11 would peel off and abandon him in his hour of need, remember? And listen, people have been betraying Jesus and abandoning Jesus ever since then. Jesus experienced that. But in chapter 7, he's experiencing hatred and hostility. Now, this began actually back in the fifth chapter. In the fifth chapter, we saw Jesus at the pool of Bethesda, and he healed the lame man there. And uh, when he did, the Bible tells us that it riled up the Jews. Chapter 5, verse 16 says this, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done those things on the Sabbath. These people wanted to kill Jesus. Now, it's very interesting um, and this teaches us a lesson. There are some people that love their beliefs and their principles more than they love people. And they're willing to harm people because they don't agree with them. People don't agree with them. They're willing to attack people and harm people over their beliefs 
Now listen, I spent a few weeks talking about fighting for what we believe in and what's right and we should, but we must always do it with the spirit of love and grace. We must always do it. We must speak the truth in love, but we must speak the truth. The Christian balances a hatred for sin with a love for sinners. We balance strength with grace and love. Paul gives a great, gives a great picture of that in 1 Corinthians 16. Verse 13 and 14. Look what he says in verse 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. This is stand, be brave and strong. And the next verse says, let all that you do be done with love. What a great picture. We are to stand. We are to be strong. We're to fight for the right things, but we're to do everything in love. That's the Christian. That's the difference in the Christian and the world. These people hated Jesus And that hatred would not go unnoticed. In fact, it brought some things to their life. And so first I want you to see their hatred caused Jesus to withdraw from them. Their hatred caused Jesus to withdraw from them. In in the first verse it says, Jesus, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. The Jews sought to kill him. And Jesus withdrew from them. See, God calls man to love God. The first and greatest commandment is what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God calls us to love him. But God also speaks very harshly about those who do not love the Lord. In fact, those who do not love the Lord are, are, are judged in the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, look at this verse. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed, O Lord, come. That's strong language, let him be accursed. It means let him be damned. Let him be damned. If one doesn't love God, let him be damned, Paul said. Paul only uses this language here and in Galatians when he talks about false teachers being judged and accursed. Jesus said if a person doesn't love him, that they're against him. If they're not with him, they're against him. Luke eleven twenty three. 23, he who is not with me is against me, but he who does not gather with me scatters. Listen, a lot of people think that they're all right with God. They're just totally indifferent. Jesus sees indifference as hostility and hatred. Jesus said, a person who is not with me is against me. Listen, folks, I don't know. I'm not very smart. I know you know that. But there's not a whole lot of middle ground there, is there? There's not a whole lot of middle ground there. There's not a whole lot of, you know, well, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, whatever. I, I'm not really, I don't hate God. I just, I just, I don't hate Jesus. I, I'm just, you know, he's okay. He's all right. No, Jesus said, you're with me or you're against me. And people in the world don't understand this. Sometimes people th- claim to have questions about Christ and the faith. And they say, well, I, I don't know yet. I have a lot of questions. And, and God doesn't mind questions. I was thinking about this this week, and by the providence of God, an email came in from David Jeremiah. I read his emails in the morning, and by the providence of God, David Jeremiah answered my question. <laughs> he said this in, Joe, in his, his devotion, he says, how many questions arise in your soul? There are more than 200 of them in the book of Job. Almost every chapter is filled with questions, and many of them are by Job himself, who was described as the most righteous person on earth. You see, God doesn't mind legitimate questions, but God knows the heart. And God knows people who ask questions to mock and to undermine the faith. In fact, many of the questions Jesus received were exactly that. Let's see if we can trap him. Let's see if we can trip him. Many people who claim to have questions are actually looking for ways to scorn and mock and ridicule the word of God. Be careful that your questions are not questions like that. Because God knows. That person who can't answer your question, who claims to be a Christian, somebody says, oh yeah, I've got them stumped. Don't worry. You don't have God stumped. In fact, God knows exactly why you're asking that question. And the Bible says this in Psalms 1 verse 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. A lot of people sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Two different type of people. God does not bless the scorner and the mocker. And be very careful with all these questions. Because you just may question yourself out of your chance to get saved. God's not obligated to you. It's grace that God would speak to you. It's grace that God would give you an opportunity to hear the gospel. There's people in their life who will live and never hear the gospel. And stand in judgment for their sin. And God can take his grace away from anywhere. Jesus did not go to this area and see those people. Just imagine the Messiah was alive And he pulled back because of their hatred. 
Matthew Henry says this, Gospel light is justly taken away from those that endeavor to extinguish it. Christ will withdraw from those that drive him from them, will hide his face from those that spit in it, and justly shut up his bowels or his heart from those who spurn at it. Be careful, your attitude towards God. But the second thing, the cause of their hatred was Jesus spoke truth to them. What really caused this hatred was not that Jesus wasn't a good man. In fact, that made it worse. He was healing sick people. He was loving people. People loved him. He loved them, but he spoke truth to them. Verse 7, he tells his disciples, excuse me, he tells his brothers, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. The world, whether it be uh, the first century Middle Eastern world that Jesus lived in or the 21st century Western world that you live in is under the sway of the evil one. Whether it's a religious world or an irreligious world, it is opposed to God and it is opposed to truth. Jesus spoke truth about their life. He spoke truth about the dead Jewish religion that did not change their sinful behaviors because it did not change their sinful hearts. And they continued on with hatred of the most loving person who ever lived and a desire to kill him. And Jesus spoke truth to that. And Jesus would prepare these men, these very men, these disciples that that are following him. He would take them aside and prepare them that they too would experience hatred. Uh, If you want to turn over, you can. John 15, very quickly. I'm going to read a couple verses. If not, just stand pat because we're going to come right back. John 15, he's in the upper room with the disciples later on. And um, John 15 and verse 18. And he tells the disciples this. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. By the way, that's a Christian. A Christian is one who's been called out of the world. You can't live for the world and walk with Jesus. Jesus called you out of the world. You've been bought out. You've been called out. You're not of the world anymore. Don't live like it. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. And the disciples lived that very thing. They went out and preached his word and they experienced the persecution that he experienced and the hatred that he experienced. And listen, I've been talking to you about speaking truth. And the reason many people don't speak truth is they know, they understand that the world will hate you if you speak too much truth. The reason we don't speak truth is because we don't want to be hated. We understand you can, people can actually hate you for telling them the truth. Back to John 7. Jesus spoke the truth. These men would speak the truth. And people get angry and hateful. But listen, regardless of the excuses people make, they say, well, I got intellectual problems with the Bible. I have moral problems. Oh, the history of the church. They did this. They did that. All all the excuses. Listen, the truth of the matter is people love sin is why they reject the gospel. People love the truth. People love the light. They hate the truth. Remember what Jesus said, uh, what John says and Jesus said over in John chapter 3 when Jesus gave us that great verse, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. A few verses later, he says this, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, and his deeds may, uh, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. It's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of light and truth. And it's a matter of the fact that people love darkness. Matthew Henry again said this, Whatever is pretended... The real cause of the world's enmity to the gospel is the testimony that it bears against sin and sinners. People don't want to give up sin. These people hated Jesus simply because he told the truth about the world, about them and their world. So, the hatred of his enemies. But secondly, I want you to see the unbelief of his brothers, the unbelief of his brothers. Verse five is an amazing verse of scripture. Uh, Look what he says. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Warren Wiersbe this week, I was reading him. This is what he says. 
It seems incredible that his brothers could have lived with him all those years and not realize the uniqueness of his person. Certainly they knew about his miracles since everybody else did. Having been in the closest contact with him, they had the best opportunity to watch him and test him, yet they were still unbelievers. Isn't that verse amazing? And some of us are shocked and upset and can't believe that our loved ones don't believe. We're shocked that maybe we feel that we failed or our, our children don't believe. We took them to church or our grandchildren don't believe. We took them to church or our spouse doesn't believe. We've prayed for them. People have talked to them. Our parents don't believe and we just can't believe. We just can't believe they don't believe. But the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And listen, there's nothing special about you. Be thankful to God that he saved you. He had mercy on you. And people are shocked that their brothers and sisters don't believe, their children don't believe, but it's common they didn't even believe Jesus. And by the way, as an aside, Jesus did have brothers and sisters. Okay? Listen, the teaching that Mary was a perpetual virgin is not scriptural. Jesus had brothers and sisters. In fact, the Bible mentions them several times in the New Testament, and the Bible even gives their names. You can't name people who don't exist. Unless you're just a big liar, you're, 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 you know, your you're made-up friend, whatever. But listen to Mark 6, 3. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. They named names. They got the receipts. These are his brothers. We know and We all grew up together. So Jesus had brothers, and those brothers did not have faith. Now, their unbelief is seen right before us in the text. John tells us they didn't believe, but if you look at the text very closely, you can tell they didn't believe. First, their unbelief is seen in their human reasoning. Their human reasoning. Uh, They looked at Jesus, and they had a plan. They they looked at things, and in their human reason, they, they, they couldn't understand why Jesus was doing what he was doing, and they had a better way. Don't we sometimes have a better way than God? You can confess that later, but it's true, right? Well, look what happens in verse 3. Now, his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself uh, seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So their reasoning was, Jesus, you're trying to make a name for yourself. You're trying to get your name out there. You're trying to become well-known. Galilee's a little black backwood place down here. The big crowds in Judea, the big crowds there in Jerusalem. Matter of fact, the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles is the biggest of all the feasts. Everybody's going to be there. Everybody who's anybody who's somebody's going to be there. And if you want to get your name out, that's the big feast. Therefore, go to the feast and show yourself publicly. That's just human reasoning. Now, there's nothing wrong with human reason. I wish more people would use it. But when it comes to spiritual things, human reason is not enough. And that's all the unbeliever has. See, Jesus' brothers did not believe, and all they had was to look at things in their human way of thinking and try to figure it out. Their reasoning was such, Jesus wants to be a big shot, go to the temple. Go to the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, we don't know their real motivation here. I've read several people who think, well, maybe they wanted the crowds to see Jesus' works and make him their political Messiah. Maybe they were mocking Jesus here. There is a little tinge here. If If you want to be known, just go show yourself all this stuff you're doing. But what we do know is this. All they had was human reason. They were Jewish men who believed in God. They weren't atheists. They believed in Jehovah. But they didn't realize the Messiah was right there with them. See, human reasoning will always lead us to worldly methods and fleshly decisions. And this is all they had. Secondly, not only their human reasoning, but their human timing. Their human timing. They say, go up to the temple. And Jesus addresses this issue of divine time. Verse 6, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. Verse 8, you go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Jesus lived with the awareness of the timing of God. 
He lived and understood God had a time for his life and a time for the things in his life. You see, the unbeliever, the unbeliever is never aware of, concerned with, or even really bound by God's timing. Any old time will do. Your time's now. Your any old time will work for you, Jesus said, because you're not thinking about God. Now think about the life of Jesus. Everything about Jesus was done in God's time. Jesus, Jesus came to this earth when it was God's time. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. In the fullness of time. Why didn't Jesus come sooner? It wasn't God's time. Why did he come when he did? It was the fullness of time. And you see it all through the Gospel of John. Remember, he's at the wedding in Galilee, Cana of Galilee there, and they run out of wine, remember? And his mother says, hey, they have no wine. She just kind of dropped a hint, you know, like, you should know what your mother's talking about. I shouldn't have to tell you. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Later on in this chapter, they, they try to arrest Jesus. They try to take him. Look at verse 30. Look at verse 30. They try to gather Jesus and take him. And verse 30 says, Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. God's divine providence, God's divine hand was with him. Later on, he does go to the, the temple and he goes in God's time. Verse 14. Now about the middle of the feast, the feast was a seven-day feast. So on day four, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Later on, in God's time, Jesus went. Interestingly, Jesus went secretively, the Bible says. So he didn't go as they wanted him to go. Go make a scene. Go, go gather people. And he didn't go when they wanted him to go. How many of you know? God often doesn't do things the way you want them and when you want them. Can I get a witness? God does things in his time, in his way. But see, the unbeliever, the reason you know these people are unbelievers, they're not aware of, concerned with, bound by, thinking about, asking about God's timing at all. The unbeliever can do whatever they want, whenever they want, but one thing they can't do is escape the consequences of choices and decisions. No one can, by the way. So I put together a little equation because I know you like math human reasoning plus human timing often equals a human mess anybody ever experienced that yeah it costs you money and effort and all this other stuff because why we got ahead of God or we reasoned it out it seemed like a good idea to us some of my worst ideas had been followed like well it seemed like a good idea at the time now, as an aside here of this, so this is an application to this. Some of us as Christians, maybe you're a point in your life when you're make, you've got some decisions to make. Maybe you're wanting to make some decisions. You want a, uh, maybe a career change or you want to move. You want to relocate. You want to move to another house or whatever. Or maybe you're looking for a relationship and you're looking for a spouse or something and you're trying to figure it out. Well, you have human reason and you have God's will. And God's will is always greater than human reason. And God's will is always determined by the principles of his word. You make your decisions based on the principles of God's word, not just human reason. So here's some principles. God will never lead you to anything that will violate his word. God will never lead you to a job that will violate his word. God will never lead you to a uh, to uh, a relationship where that relationship will hinder your spiritual life. Uh, God will never lead you to a job that will hurt you spiritually, that will hurt your family. God will not lead you in those ways. That's human reason. And I know, well, it's more money. Surely God's in that, right? Not necessarily. More money may not be the reason. It may not be the answer. More money doesn't necessarily mean it's God's will. The Bible specifically says God will not, that we're not to be unevenly yoked. Christians should not uh, be married to unbelievers. We should not conduct our relationships in sinful, worldly ways. 
Folks, you shouldn't be in relationships and in jobs that will hinder you spiritually. If a relationship will hurt your spiritual life, it's not of God. And then when it is of God, it will be God's timing. It will be God's timing. Uh, You know, there may be something that there's nothing wrong with doing it, but it's not God's will because it's not God's time. Some of you like music. You like those. uh, Remember some of us remember old music. There was a song, remember the bird sang to everything. Turn, turn, turn. There is a season. Turn, turn, turn. And a time for every purpose under heaven. That came from the Bible if you didn't know that. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 1 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. God has a time. That goes on to talk about everything. A time to be born, a time to die. On and on it goes. There is a season and a purpose and a time, and God can lead you in that. And while the unbeliever is not concerned with God's will or God's time, the Christian, if he's going to be a disciple, if he or she is going to be a disciple, is very concerned about God's will and God's time. Just because you can't think of a reason not to do it doesn't mean it's God's will. Just because you can't afford it doesn't mean it's God's will. You have to seek the Lord. You have to seek his time and listen. The Christian desires to follow Jesus. Jesus was always in God's will and on God's time. And if I'm following him, I will be in God's will and on God's time. And when I get out of time... He has a way of getting me back in time. So what is the key word? Well, there's a key word, wait. Wait. The Bible uses this word often. Now I know it's a word we hate. This is why we microwave everything. We hate to wait. <laughs> and when, we were, when our kids were little, they would be in the car with us. We'd go through a drive through restaurant sometimes, and it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't come out immediately. And my son Donald would inevitably say, he said it several times, I thought this was fast food. I'm like, well, it is fast food, but it's just not fast. It can't be fast food. Okay, I'm not going to argue that. Okay, you got it. Sometimes that's the way we are. We want God to move now. We, why didn't God do it yesterday? But sometimes the Bible tells us to wait. Waiting is a part of faith. It's a part of discipleship. It's a part of listening to God. Isaiah 40, 31, many of you know this verse, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God has a power to give us when we wait on him. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good cheer. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Don't get far ahead of God. Don't get away from God. Wait on the Lord. Learn to listen. Get in his word and let God strengthen your heart and lead your steps. Now, back to Jesus. Jesus is obeying God's will. He's in God's time. The disciples misunderstood Jesus was not there to make a name for himself or become famous. Jesus was there to die for the sins of the world. Jesus was there to follow God's plan, to be, to, to be turned over in his good time, in God's good time. He would turn his life over to those people who wanted to kill him, but it wasn't his time. Later on in John chapter 12, this whole theme of his time runs through the gospel of John. Later on in John chapter 12, Jesus talks about this. Look what he says, John 12, 23. But Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Now it's God's time. He's going to go into the upper room in chapter 13 through 17. He's going to be arrested in chapter 18. He's going to be crucified and rise again in the rest of this book. Chapter 12, verse 27, Jesus said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Should I pray God save me? No, because I came to this very hour to die on the cross. This is why I'm here. I came for this very purpose, to this moment, that I could die for sins. And in chapter 12, verse 32, he said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. That was his hour, to be lifted up on that cross, that he might draw whosoever will, whosoever may come, whosoever may believe, may have their sins forgiven, may have eternal life, may know that they're going to heaven when they die, not because they're good, but because God is good, and he forgives sinners. Now, good news. The good news is this. Jesus' family became believers. The good news is Jesus' family became believers. These brothers that we read about earlier, James authored the New Testament letter, the book of James. He became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Judas, or Jude, wrote the next to last book in the Bible, the book of Jude. That was Jesus' brother that wrote that book. 
But listen, they didn't believe until after the resurrection. You want to talk about how long they stayed in their unbelief? How do we know this? Well, remember on the cross, Jesus is hanging there. In John chapter 19, Mary is there. And the Bible says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And he said, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her to his home. Why? Because Jesus' brothers weren't there. Here's his mother at the cross watching him die. His unbelieving brothers aren't even there. And they're out somewhere. Maybe they're afraid they'll come get the rest of us. Maybe they'll identify me as part of his family and they'll arrest me too thinking that we're going to be part of this, this whole overthrowing of the government, whatever it is, these charges that they have. So his brothers aren't even there at the cross. But later on, after the resurrection... We read in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, look at these words. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Somehow after the resurrection, maybe one of these people went and gave a testimony. Maybe Mary went and gave a testimony. We don't know, but we know they're not there in John 19. In Acts chapter 1, right before the day of Pentecost, they're there in the upper room, and they're involved in that prayer meeting that went 10 days, and the Holy Spirit came, and the church was born. And while we are not specifically told that every one of them believed, not specifically gives us name, he believed, he believed, she believed. Listen, could you imagine if one of them didn't believe? Could you imagine how famous they would be if they didn't believe? The Jews would have interviewed them. They'd have been on Oprah Winfrey and all the TV shows. They'd have been on everything if they didn't believe. Just imagine, this man's claimed to be the, this man's claimed to be the son of God, the, the savior of the world, he has resurrected, and his own sister, his own brother, doesn't believe in him. But I was thinking about this passage of scripture this week in this verse. In my sanctified imagination, I got to thinking about verse 5. For even his brothers did not believe in him. So just imagine when they read this, when they read the gospel of John for the first time. They didn't write it. John wrote it. And then they get their copy of it. Imagine they're sitting in church for the first time. And, you know, what they did was they read the scriptures out loud, like a lot of it. A lot of it. They would read whole letters out loud. The whole service would be they just read the scripture from one end to the other. Imagine you're sitting there for even his brothers didn't believe. And somebody looks over and what's wrong with you, man? Imagine, they, you know, they probably got to go on a speaking tour and give their testimony. Everybody wants to know, what took you so long, man? Even his brothers didn't believe. And his mother was at the cross and you weren't even there. You know, I realize that there's a certain amount of humiliation that's often required to bring us to faith and to keep us in the faith. There's a certain amount of humiliation that requires. Some of you may be here and you've wandered away and maybe God's had to humiliate you a little bit to humble you, to get you to bow your knee to him. Do you ever think that James, who wrote that letter, and Jude, who wrote that letter, and Simon and Joseph, do you ever think that they ever looked down on anybody who was an unbeliever after that? You think they ever had that conversation? I can't believe that guy's such a hardhead he don't believe. Somebody said, well, where were you at the cross, dude? But here's the reminder. This reminds us not to lose hope for our unbelieving ones. This reminds us don't give up. Keep praying. Keep believing. There may be some unbeliever sitting here today next to you who's never come to Christ. Pray. This may be the day that they repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When I told you this morning, when we started this message, I told you what I want you to know is that everyone responds to Jesus. You've heard the gospel today that Christ died for your sins. You may say, I'm going to sit there and do nothing. You're responding. Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. You're responding. Your indifference is not indifferent to God. God's not indifferent about your indifference. What I want you to believe is that it matters. Coming to Christ makes all the difference in the world. Not only can it change your heart now, it will change your eternity now, your eternity. And what I want you to do is whatever it is in your individual personal life that you need to do this morning to respond to Jesus properly. Maybe you're a Christian here, but you're out of the will of God in an area and you've got to turn back. 
Maybe you're about to make some decision, but you know you really hadn't prayed over it that much. It was just looked too good to be true. It was just so easy. Everything was just going to work out so easy, and you hadn't even prayed about it. Maybe you're a Christian, but you've never been baptized. You've never proclaimed your faith in Christ, but you know you're a Christian, but you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Maybe you live your life with human reasoning, and you come hear sermons, but you go live your life without God. You need to repent and turn to God. If you've never been saved, repent. Ask Jesus Christ to come into your life to forgive you of your sins, to be your Lord and Savior. Do not have it be written of you that even this person didn't believe in him. Come to Christ this morning. There's someone you need to pray for. There's some unbeliever. Pray for him today. Let's pray together. Well, Bond's going to come. And uh, as he comes, I'm going to pray. And then we're going to stand and sing. If you have need of Jesus this morning, you come. You have need of prayer this morning, you come.